Hello everyone, welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are currently in Jeremiah chapter 38 and we resume our study. Actually, we left off in verse 3, but I'm going to go back and begin in verse 1. So let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And before we begin, I do want to tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website briefly. That is a place where you can study the whole Bible, just as we're going to do today, right now. Study the whole Bible at your pace, at your convenience, and that can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Read the Bible with me, study the Bible with me, using my audio Bible commentaries from Genesis through Revelation. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And let's get into the Word of God, Jeremiah 38. Father, again, we ask your blessings on your word. Amen. Then Shepatiah, the son of Matan, and Gadaliah, the son of Pashur, and Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pashur, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life as a prey, and shall live. Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Now, God decided, he decided that for punishment for his people, who not only sinned, but refused to repent for years, he would bring disaster on Jerusalem, the city that he loved so much and God was telling his people through Jeremiah if you fight Babylon you are dead and God said if you surrender though you're going to fare better the Israelite leaders didn't like that message they didn't like those two options as I said last time they didn't like those two choices but they were not getting a third verse 4 Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death, for thus he weakeneth the hands of the people of war who remain in this city, and the hands of all the people by speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. God's faithful preachers are often seen as troublemakers. And that's how Jeremiah was viewed. He's nothing but trouble. And they're called trouble because they make sinners feel uncomfortable in their sin. Well, that's the way they're supposed to feel. And a lot of times, those of us who preach the pure word of God without watering it down are called dividers because we point out divisions that are already there the truth the truth has been spoken it is orthodox since the beginning of the church age and really before that back to the very beginning of Adam and Eve there has been doctrinal truth there has been moral righteousness the Word of God has remained the Word of God nothing has changed it is the false teachers, it is those who water down the truth in order to be acceptable like the contemporary preachers of Jeremiah's day that were falling away from the truth. And that's what happens today. When people water down the word of God, they have caused a division. Faithful preachers will point out false doctrine. That's not causing division. That's not unloving. That's 
that's trying to correct the division that the false teachers have already caused. And so Jeremiah is not the problem. He's the solution. It's just that the people don't want the solution. And that's usually the case. Zen, uh, verse, verse 5, Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand, for the king is not he that can do anything against you. You know, this king, Zedekiah, if he would have been a leader worthy of the title, he would have, he would have stood up for Jeremiah and said, Look, this man is preaching the word of God, and it doesn't matter if you don't like it or not. It doesn't matter if I don't like it or not. We're going to listen to him. We're going to treat him well. We're going to treat him with respect because at least he's standing for truth. That's the leader's job is to promote what is right in the eyes of God. Zedekiah did exactly what leaders are not supposed to do, take a hands-off approach to what is wrong and just leave it be and hope that it'll go away or pass the buck on to somebody else. That's not, that's not being a leader. Verse 6, Then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malachi, the son of Hamalek, which was in the court of the prison. And he let down Jeremiah with cords, and in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sank in the mire. Jeremiah has preached for decades. He has preached for decades repentance, the pure word of God, warning from God against sin, and no one repented. And now here he is standing in the mud in an underground dungeon. If a man of God preaches the word of God clearly, as he should, then he's not going to be popular in any age, but especially in an age where false teaching and watered-down preaching has become the norm. He's going to be even less popular. That's the case. That's what it was in Jeremiah's day. That's what it's coming to, and that really, that's what it is today. And so Jeremiah has preached for decades. No one has repented. Now he's suffering. And that's going to be the case in any time period if you're a faithful preacher. And now a faithful preacher may not be beaten and thrown into a mud hole like Jeremiah, but he's not going to be popular either. Verse 7. Now when Ebed, Melek, the Ethiopian one of the eunuchs who was in the king's house heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. The king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin. Ebed Melech went forth out of the king's house and spoke to the king saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet whom they have cast into the dungeon and he is likely to die of hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Now, this man wasn't even a Hebrew, but he had more spiritual sense than they did. He knew it was wrong to persecute a good man of God and lock him up and throw him in the most disgusting place simply for preaching the word of God. So he went and he complained to the king about it. He took a stand on behalf of Jeremiah. Verse 10. Then the king commanded ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. It wouldn't take thirty men to get Jeremiah out of the mud hole but it would probably they probably take that many men to guard him against those who wanted him to stay there or worse so 30 men are assigned to this Ethiopian to save Jeremiah verse 11 so Ebed Melech took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took from thence old cast off clothes and old rotten rags 
and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. God used worn out garments to rescue his prophet out of that mud hole, out of that dungeon. God uses sometimes the most strange things to work on behalf of his people or to work through his people. Here he uses an Ethiopian. The guy didn't even have Hebrew blood flowing through his vein to save a preacher of God's word from a bunch of Hebrews, supposedly God's people who didn't want to hear it. And then they used old beat up rags and dirty, muddy, filthy, torn garments to rescue Jeremiah. God doesn't always and only use the spectacular, the things that people would, you know, genuinely think of what God might use. Conventional wisdom. That's the word that I was searching for. God doesn't always and only use things that people would consider to be conventional wisdom. In fact, most of his work seems to be accomplished using simple, everyday things and sometimes sometimes things that you would never think of. Verse 12. You can't put God in a box. Boy, I know that. And, and, and think he got figured, he figured out how he's going to do things. So verse 12. And ebed Melech the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast-off clothes and rotten rags under thine armpits, under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. Verse 13. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Jeremiah is confined to the courtyard. He's in a, he's he's still in prison, as it were, but it's a whole lot better than what it was. And he wasn't he was not confined at this time as punishment, but actually for protection. He had to be locked up so that the other Hebrews out in the land wouldn't kill him. Verse 14. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry, that is, in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing from me. Now that sounds real good, right? The king calls for Jeremiah and he says, and he says to him, he says, I'm going to ask you something, and I want you to be completely and totally honest with me, Jeremiah. I'm interested in nothing but the truth, and that sounds real good. It sounds like the king is open to the truth, doesn't it? But really, he isn't. He wants Jeremiah to give him a prophecy of what's going to happen. He just, he just wants it to be, and he hopes that there will be a revision from the previous bad news prophecies that Jeremiah has been speaking concerning the country, concerning it being uh, conquered by Babylon, and even concerning the king himself. So he wants to know the truth, he says, but if it's not what he wants to hear, he's not going to be too happy with that. Notice verse 15. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? And if I declare it unto thee, excuse me, and if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So Jeremiah is saying, you know, if I tell you the truth, king, you're going to kill me. And if I give you advice from that truth, you're not going to take it. So why does he want to know? You know, a preacher can sometimes feel like he is just spinning his wheels, wasting his time. It can be discouraging. I mean, there have been times when I have prepared, for example, to do some biblical counseling between husbands and wives. On more than one occasion, I mean, and I know I have prepared completely and totally, and I was ready. And I was filled with the Word of God, and I was filled with godly, biblical counsel for these people. And I knew 10 minutes into it, 
that neither one of them were interested in listening to what I what I had to say. They called for me. They wanted me. Oh, we want help. And then I give it to them, and they're not in, they're not interested in doing what God wants. They're only interested in doing what they want. And if it happens to line up with what God wants, they'll do it. If it doesn't, well, then they're not going to do what God wants them to do. So it goes on. It's a mess, and it falls apart, and it, it destroys. And that's what happens. That w- that's what happened every single time that my biblical counsel was not taken. So you ask for help, you ask for the word of God, and you have no intentions of accepting it or applying it. You're just wasting the preacher's time. This king is wasting Jeremiah's time. But like me, he's going to give him the truth anyway. Verse 16. So Zedekiah the king swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth, who made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men who seek thy life. Well, at least I'm not going to kill you. I I won't kill you. And I won't hand you over to those who want to kill you. Verse 17. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, Here it is. You wanted the truth. If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live and thine house. In other words, Jeremiah tells the king, you need to surrender. A complete and total, absolute surrender. So he tells the king what he needs to do, And to help him make the right decision, he warns of big trouble if he doesn't do the right thing. Notice verse 18, here it comes. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. That's the flip side, O king. You want the truth? I just gave it to them. You want to be blessed the best you can in the midst of God's punishment? Then surrender and submit to God's instrument, which is Babylon, and it will go as well with you as it possibly can given the circumstances. If you don't, it's going to get worse. Now, the king is already in trouble for disobeying God but he's going to be in a lot more trouble if he continues to disobey God. He has to start doing the right thing right now to, to lessen the punishment of God. It's, otherwise, it's just going to get worse. It's never too late to start obeying God. Even in the midst of God's punishment, if you start obeying God right now, you may not be able to reverse the consequences of your previous sin, but you can stop it from getting worse. You can at least be in fellowship with God if you start obeying him even in the midst of your punishment and then he can start blessing you. Verse 19 And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah I am afraid of the Jews who are fallen to the Chaldeans lest they deliver me into their hand and they mock me. I can't surrender my fellow my fellow citizens over in Babylon if I surrender to the Babylonians And they take me into Babylon, and my people who are already taken captive over there find out that I surrendered, then I'm going to really be in trouble with them. I'm going to be in trouble with my own people. Now, if the king is thinking about disobeying God for fear of being picked on by his own people in Babylon, he better quit thinking that way. He better bring his thoughts under the control of of the obedience to God's word because he has already caused a whole lot of trouble for Jeremiah because Jeremiah has been obedient so he ought to be willing to take some of his own medicine and be in, be in trouble if need be for being obedient as well it's about obeying God and he didn't have any problems punishing Jeremiah 
causing Jeremiah to suffer because Jeremiah was obedient to God. Now he's afraid of obeying God himself because he might get into some hot water with his own people. Well, take it like a man and start obeying God, even if it's going to cost you something. At least you'll be right with God. That's the way you got to look at it. Yeah, you might, not, you might not make friends and influence people if you obey the Word of God or if you proclaim the Word of God clearly, but at least you're going to be right with God. Verse 20. But Jeremiah said, and look at, he even gives him assurance. But Jeremiah said, they shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well with thee, and thy soul shall live. Jeremiah reassures him. He says, you're afraid of being in trouble with your people if you surrender to the Babylonians and obey God. I'm here to tell you, God has assured you that it's going to be okay. You'll be all right. God will take care of you. 21. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord hath shown me. And behold, all the women who are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes, and those women shall say, Thy friends have set thee up and prevailed and have prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire, and they have turned away back. In other words, the king is faced with a real test of faith here. And he is. If he does the scary thing in obedience to God, he will be okay. God has assured him that he will be okay. Now it's going to take guts. More than that, it's going to take faith. You have to believe the word of God through Jeremiah, king, and do what God says. Surrender to the Babylonians. And that's a scary thing because he's going to take you to your people who are already in Babylon and you're afraid that they're going to hate you because you surrendered. But you've got to obey God. In spite of your fears, you have to do what is right with, in the eyes of God and he will take care of you. It'll be okay. But if you panic and you disobey God, doing what may come natural to you and what may come natural to your sin nature, you're going to cause your own ruin. That, that's, that's a decision that he has to make. You're going to follow the flesh. You're going to follow the word of God. One leads to destruction every time. The other one may be a little scary, but it involves faith in God, the fact that he doesn't lie. Do what is right and trust him to take care of you. That's always the best route. See, that's the choice that you and I as Christians have to face all the time, isn't it? Verse 23. So they shall bring out all thy wives and thy children to the Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon, and thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. You know, people sometimes sin to avoid trouble. And if Zedekiah goes that route, in order he thinks to avoid trouble, he's going to find out that by sinning, you just walk into that trouble that you tried to avoid in the first place, and it's probably going to be a lot worse. Jeremiah is trying to get the king to understand this and choose to follow God. Put the brakes on to your temptation. Put the brakes on to your sin. Repent before you go head first into that sin that is tempting you. Come to your senses. Listen to the Spirit of God who is saying, stop, stop, don't go there. Pull back. Turn to God. Do what is right. Do what is right. Are you going to face hardship like you never thought? You're going to face misery like you never thought. Verse 24. Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. Well, he didn't say, yeah, I'll do what God says. He just says, don't tell anybody we had this conversation, and I won't kill you. That doesn't sound too promising, does it? The king doesn't want anyone to know about his candid conversation with Jeremiah. 
he he wanted it i mean he he's the one who called for it he was glad for it but he didn't want anybody to know about it a godly person speaks well of the lord in public and is not ashamed to proclaim what god has told him in secret he's willing to accept reproach from sinners if need be to proclaim what God has told him but a man like this king Zedekiah loves the praise of men more than the praise of God he is more concerned about people finding out that he actually called for and talked to candidly Jeremiah about the word of the Lord he don't want people to find out that he even did that he's more concerned about that than he is about disobeying God his concern is in the wrong place verse 25 but if the princes hear that I have talked with thee and they come unto thee and say unto thee declare unto us now what thou hast said unto the king also what the king said unto thee Hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death. So if somebody threatens you, if somebody finds out about this little meeting, and they come up to you and they say, and they say, Jeremiah, you tell us what was said. You tell us what you told the king, you tell us what the king said, or we're going to kill you. So Jeremiah, once again, he's on the hot seat. 26, king says, king's giving them advice. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplication before the king, that he would not cause me to return to Jonathan's house to die there. Well, that's not exactly true. The king wants him to lie, to save his own skin. Well, that's what he would do. People lie because they're afraid. They're afraid of not being as popular as they want to be. They're afraid that somebody's going to hurt them. They're afraid that somebody's not going to admire them. So they lie. They're afraid they're going to miss out on some money, so they lie. They're afraid that they're going to miss out on some position, so they lie. They're afraid. Rather than trusting God and doing what is right, they're afraid. 27th then came, sure enough, all the princes unto Jeremiah and asked him, and he told them according to all these words that the king had commanded. So they left off speaking with him, for the matter was not perceived. So Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison until the day that Jeremiah was taken and he was there when Jerusalem was taken Jeremiah I don't know seems to me I guess you can be the judge seems to me if he did what the if he did what the king told him to do and it says that he did that he said what the king told him to say um, he, he told a lie didn't he I mean, because he, he didn't bring up, hey, don't put me back in that dungeon. That's not why he went before the king. And yet the Bible says, the Bible says, then the princes, all the, then came all the princes unto Jeremiah and asked him, and he told them according to all these words that the king had commanded. So it seems to me, Jeremiah, you know, he kind of caved a little bit here himself. And he wasn't exactly truthful. Now, he didn't say everything that went on in that conversation, and there's no need to, uh, you know, to tell people. You're not obligated to tell people everything that you know about everything. But it seems like he caved to me, which just goes to show that in, in, in a moment, in any given moment, even God's faithful people can fail. The important thing is, when you love God, when you love Jesus, you get back on track. And the Word of God will help you to, to get back on track really well. It'll strengthen your faith and give you the strength to persevere. And I hope that you check out the BibleVerseByVerse.com and begin a verse-by-verse -verse study through the whole Bible using my audio Bible commentaries. That's the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And if the Word of God blesses you, would you please remember and prayerfully consider 
that we are brought to you by your tithes, your offerings, and your prayerful support. And you can give in a secure method at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Just click on the donate button and give as the Lord may lead. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse, reminding you once again that our website is found at the BibleVerseByVerse.com.